just check the time, mute my phone.
Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome to MAV Health and Wellness Committee's live session. I'm your host Asma Shweb. May is the National Mental Health Awareness Month and we observe this month by raising awareness about mental health issues and by connecting each other to the available resources in this regard. Mental health check starts with self-care, taking care of your own self first and foremost and knowing the, the signs and symptoms of your stress and anxieties and knowing how to manage those is the key for mental health. Um, and then gaining knowledge, beneficial knowledge on the common mental health issues and the preventive measure is the objective of my, of my session today. Of course, we all are devastated by the tragic death of 21 uh, people that happened yesterday in the Texas school. Uh, unfortunately, this is not a um, new thing for us in, here in the United States. Unfortunately, that we have seen too many of these incidents to just ignore and move forward. There are so many things on political level that have to be done to prevent these. Every single day morning, sending your kids to school, like myself, is a, is like is a nightmare. You you like we are surrounded by so many um, like evils around us that we wonder like what will happen. So politically, at political level, of course, there are so many things that need to be done and that should be done and that will be done. We really hope that. But on, on, on a mental health level and on our scale as a community, as an individual, what can we do to prevent these? What are the signs and symptoms of these kids that you notice in your children that need to be addressed early on to prevent some of these kind of tragedies to be happening like down the road? How do we, how do we, uh, how do we know like these are the signs and symptoms? How do we know like, what is the time to seek help, where to go to seek help? And that is the objective and I have for this, I have the, uh, my honorable guest, Dr. Krishna Madaraju, who is the president of Century Pediatrics with the offices in Woodbridge and Herendon. He's an active uh, mental health coach for the youth in our community. And he's been, he has a lot of experience being a pediatrician, dealing with um, the youth in our community with these signs and symptoms and knowing how to guide them and how to, how to treat them, I would say. So the, he plays a key role, of course, in educating and we are, uh, honored to have him here and he will go over some common signs and symptoms of first and foremost he will go over some common uh, problems of mental health issues that our youth has in this day and age and then he will go over of course the options of treatment and the available resources in our community and as we know like as parents as adults this is our key responsibility to to get knowledge and the right knowledge ourselves so we can help others so we need to help ourselves first our kids and if you are like uh, parents, grandparents, if you have like, uh, if you're community leaders, we need to know the signs and symptoms of these mental health issues. And we need to know how to address them and when to address them at the right time. Uh, I welcome you Dr. Madaraju on my, um, on my session. It's really an honor to have you today. And unfortunately like this, since yesterday, I've been thinking and uh, like all the other parents, I'm sure like all of us, they are in a in a different different mind zone. Like, can these tragedies be prevented? Were, were we will somebody is like is somebody able to prevent these? Like, what if my child was there? What if what are the signs and symptoms that I see in my children that are the the red flags that you know that we need to address here and now? So please go over. Um, please start your presentation on however you want, and then we will allow the audience to ask questions. I think some young people will be joining us as well. So everyone who has questions, please hold on to the questions till the end. If you're watching me on Facebook, you can uh, post your the question in the comment box. If you're watching us on Zoom, please post your question in the chat box and I'll, I'll address or you will be allowed to ask those questions at the end of the presentation. So hi, Dr. Malaraju, thank you very much for your time. I know you are a busy person, but thank you. For introduce yourself a little bit to our audience and then please start with your presentation about mental health and it's really needed not only in this month since this is the national mental health awareness month but especially today for a lot of us thank you um Shasmari, uh, for <clears throat> having me again i'm dr krishna madiraju i'm a pediatrician we have offices in fredericksburg stafford uh, Woodbridge and in Herndon also, so in Northern Virginia. I've been practicing for the last uh, 25 years or so, and I I have a passion for this. Actually, you know, the whole thing about um, 
this mental health awareness started a few years ago when myself and my colleagues uh, uh, formed an organization called UNDCA, um, and which is now called Lead America. But basically, we we started this in response to like uh, teen suicide, like you know Thomas Jefferson High School. Some kid uh, killed himself, and we were really shaken as parents. Like, hey, uh, what are we going to do about this? Every time something bad happens, people like come and they want to do something about it, but then the whole thing fizzles away. And we said, like, let us face this head on. So the slides which I'm going to like show you now are, um, you know, are the initial things which we came across. And they said, like, what what happens when someone is depressed? Why does it happen? What happens in substance abuse? To just give you a perspective, it's 200 to 300 people die per day from addiction. 200 to 300 people. It's almost like one plane crashing every single day. And communities are devastated because of this. <clears throat> so what can we do about it? How can we prevent it? The best way, in my opinion, is to educate ourselves as parents, like what are the signs, how to watch it out. And this whole presentation, I want to make it as uh, simple as possible, I mean, as simple as possible so that people can follow through and understand. And at the end, you can ask me some questions if you need some clarification. Um, <clears throat> so let me start with the neurobiology of addiction. Why I chose this is before I became a pediatrician back in India, I was a neurosurgeon. I was trained to become a neurosurgeon. Everything I see, I try to see like why this happens, whether it is addiction, depression, anxiety, these are all disorders of the brain. So how what what happens in the brain the brain it connects there are nerve cells which connect to each other one nerve let us say this is a this is one nerve cell connects to the other nerve cell and there is a small space in between uh, which is marked here number three this is called a synapse this synapse is where like one nerve communicates with the other nerve and little packets of uh, neurotransmitters are released from one end of the nerve these neurotransmitters, there is four main neurotransmitters, which today we are going to talk about. Number one is dopamine. Number two is glut glutamine. Number three is norepinephrine. And the other one is serotonin. So for the purposes of addiction, the two things which are really important to understand is dopamine. And when dopamine is released here, it's up, it is taken back into these uh, cells. And these, these things which are in blue, these are called the receptors. This is where the go, dopamine goes and attach, attaches to, and that's how the nerve impulse um, gets transmitted. Dopamine, when you get dopamine, you feel happy, right? You know, the, I want you to think of it as a pleasure neurotransmitter. So to explain this whole story, I want to like tell it to you in the form of a story, right? We want to like think of a fictional person. Her name is Katie. You can call her anything else also, right? So Katie suffers an injury that requires surgery. Throughout the healing process, she's prescribed painkillers. Most people think that uh, children or like teenagers get addicted directly from somebody else. But prescription drugs are one of the most commonly abused drugs among 12 to 13 year olds. So. Katie was a regular student. She suffered an injury, and but her doctor prescribed her pres prescription painkillers. These are like uh, <clears throat> very strong uh, pa painkillers, like Vicodin or stuff like that. So when she, what happens in her brain? Now, again, I just want to give you this green colored area is called the frontal cortex. This is the front portion of your brain. This is what is connected with the higher intellectual function, like reasoning, thinking, you know, analysis and everything goes in the front portion of your brain. Now, the basal ganglia, this is where like all these uh, drugs and all these things act. This is called the midbrain, basal ganglia and amygdala. I'm going to come back to this, but there are three different uh, phases. The first phase is called binge intoxication. Binge, binge meaning like suppose you drink alcohol or you did drugs or you took these painkillers, like in Katie's case, the this area gets stimulated. So, in Katie's case, what happened after a few months of taking the painkillers, 
Katie notices that it won't work. So she begins to take more pills than prescribed. So instead of the doctor said to take one pill, she's taking more pills. So now um, this is called craving. We call it as craving because the, normally, I want to just show you something like brain uh, has like, uh, if you, let us say you got a nice job promotion, the dopamine level goes up, let us say 50 points. Suppose you win a lottery, it goes up to 100 points. So you feel very happy when dopamine is high. But let us say you started using drugs or you started playing too much video games or you did like too many things which will going to give you too much pleasure. Like in Katie's case, she took painkiller. Look at this red line. Her dopamine level went to 1,000. So her brain is now getting used to 1,000 every single time that she's taking the painkiller. So what will happen next time she takes, she gets like a first, like A plus in her exam, she's not going to get happy. So this is what drugs do to you. They make the, they, they hijack, they hijack your brain, right? Now I told you the frontal lobe, the front portion of your brain, this is where love, morality, responsibility, spirituality, like religious uh, behavior, all these things are there. So when you are practicing spiritual practices and other things, then your front of your uh, brain gets stronger, right? The midbrain on the other end is non-conscious. It is like flight or fight. You know, this is the midbrain, mid which is where the drugs are acting on. Um, and they make you very weak at this point. So when Katie started eating those uh, painkillers, her midbrain started activating. Now, there's a second portion called the amygdala. In this amygdala, the second neurotransmitter, which I talked about other than dopamine, is called glutamate. This glutamate makes it memory. Are, I took that pain medicine, I felt so good. I took that alcohol, I felt so good. So this glutamate reinforces addiction. So um, this is where like, people get used to asking for more and more of uh, uh, either playing video games or something like that. So once craving sets in, then the brain will start making its own reasoning, like why you should not give up uh, these uh, drugs or something like that. And then if you don't take drugs, you may get pain. If you don't take drugs, you may get anxiety. So it will start reasoning. Uh, they may start lying, they start manipulating, stealing, rationalizing their behavior. So what Katie is doing, she quickly runs out of her prescriptions and she feels that she needs it. She starts stealing medicines from, from friends' medicine cabinet and uh, she starts crushing them and starting snorting them. So most of the times we don't realize, but sometimes if you leave empty drawers, all these pills, the kids can get into it. So please be careful about that. So um, now Katie's parents notice that she's behaving strangely. She has a new set of friends. They find some loose pills. They become concerned and they confront her, but she says, no, I don't have any problem. So denial is part of that also. So you need to like watch out for these in your children. Katie asks her doctor to, for more painkillers, but he doesn't uh, refuse, but he refuses it. Like a good doctor, he doesn't give her more pain pills. So she starts developing withdrawals. Withdrawals, uh, meaning like if you don't have the pill, then you feel like shaking, you're sweating, and all those side effects are happening. And those things are really the reason why these um, uh, children, they keep going back for these medications because they cannot control their withdrawal. And this is where the parents need to help if someone is having a family member going through this. Now, her friend Jacob says that he has heroin, which is uh, also an opioid. And Katie never thought that she's going to use heroin, but she feels desperate to stop her withdrawal symptoms. And now she upgrades herself to uh, heroin. So again, what these drugs are doing is they're hijacking the pleasure uh, reactions of the brain. Now, Katie's tolerance is very, very high. She cannot afford. Um, so her friend says that she wants, she can use less heroin if she starts injecting it. She's afraid of needles, but her friend Jacob offers her to inject the heroin. She agrees, but neither of them know 
that what happened is that the heroin that he bought is laced with a medicine called fentanyl. Though this fentanyl comes from, you know, countries like China and other things, they, they're adding this into these drugs to make it stronger. But those people who are adding that into the fentanyl, into these drugs, they don't know how much to add. And fentanyl is so strong. If you give a little bit more, then it can stop somebody's breathing. That's what happened to Katie. She's breathing very slowly and she turns blue and Jacob calls 911 and leaves her. At least Jacob is a good friend. At least he called 911 and he just leave, left her there and he ran away because he's scared. And this is how most people die from drug abuse, you know, because they don't know. They think they're taking the regular drug, but unfortunately, if it comes laced with fentanyl, hundreds of people per day die because of something like this. So the paramedics come, find her, then they administer naloxone. Naloxone is the treatment which reverses the heroin overdose. So they need to give her more naloxone because it is fentanyl is so strong. She's watched carefully. Naloxone, the brand name is Narcan, is a drug which is reverses the uh, opioid overdose and it saves the, the lives. Soon after that, Katie's parents like now realize they enroll her into a program and she's getting medicated, assisted treatment. Katie is in recovery and she's recovering very well. This is how, I mean, Katie's story ended very well. She, she was able to be saved, but unfortunately many kids do not survive this sudden exposure uh, to fentanyl. So what we do in treatment is we give uh, something a little bit like um, these medications, they're called buprenorphine and methadone, which increase the dopamine a little bit so that we can control these cravings, that the withdrawals, and slowly bring this um, thing uh, down. The good news is 75% of the patients can be treated. This is much better than treating blood pressure, for example. Okay, 75%. This is the news that I would like to share with families is that if your child is going through drug addiction or something like that, or if you know a friend who's going through drug addiction, you should know that, yes, we can save 75%. It is effective, right? So we know what, where, which portion of the effect brain is affected, midbrain. What happens? It is brain is hijacked with the drugs. How can we uh, control? How can we control it is by bringing the uh, red line down. So instead of every time you're taking the medicine, it's going to 1000, you bring the dopamine to slowly to 500, 250, and slowly wean it off. But unfortunately, next time they see somebody taking drugs again, or they take, if they have been fine for three years and suddenly they take this drug again, they reverse back to the original place. So the family members really need to help the um, child or the young adolescent to get rid of uh, this problem. The division of labor, the midbrain, the whatever medicines that we are giving works in the midbrain, but the behavioral therapy works, like suppose they're going attending religious prayers or something like that, or they're having a good support system within the family that is working on the front of the brain, frontal lobe. So combinedly together they're working and they're helping um, them get out of this. So. Uh, we need to give them coping skills, stress relief, social support, safe environment, promote spiritual growth and personal development. These are very, very important. And how can we help remove the stigma or discrimination? It's not her fault. For example, Katie was an athlete. She was playing and she became addicted because her doctor gave her too strong pain medication. Whatever you, how, how you deal with children who are facing, young adults who are facing this problem is should not, Base should be based on science. You know, share this story with your family members so that they won't be criminalized when someone is facing it. You have to empathize with this uh, patient, with these patients, and also apply this to the criminal justice world so that they're not like put in jail. Putting somebody in jail is the worst thing that you could do because uh, how are they going to get better? We need to give them medication to slowly bring this, bring them out. These are our family members. These are our brothers and sisters. And we need to share good information with children so they would not start doing this from the beginning. Now, the second part of the presentation is, again, what we saw in the kid with TJ, right? Um, 
somebody who's been challenged. I mean, we live in Northern Virginia. The children are going through so much of stress. So sometimes they cannot handle the stress. And suddenly one day the kid has committed suicide and then everybody's wondering like, hey, what has happened? Could we have prevented this? Yes, could, we could have prevented it. So what are the signs you need to watch out for? Is the child losing interest in previously pleasurable activities? Or is there any social withdrawal? Is there a change in eating and sleeping habits? Eating very little or eating too much? Sleeping very little or sleeping too much? Persistent sadness, unhealthy use of substances, or just saying like, look, I wouldn't want to live anymore. So watch out for these signs and symptoms, right? Now, this is a model which shows like what happens when someone like breaks the barrier and like attempts suicide or something like that, right? First, you don't have any suicide radiation, but let us say you are of a genetic risk factor. Something really was very wrong in the family. The parents are like fighting with each other all the time, or there is a substance abuse, like we talked about drug abuse. Um, there is two things which are really important. Impulsivity, that means they cannot control what they want to do. Or pessimism. Pessimism is uh, nothing is going to improve. And my life, I mean, there is really nothing much I can do. So pessimism, when it's combined with impulsivity and combination with drug abuse or something like that, um, then it can. So at that point, if some stress happens, let us say they failed the exam or the girlfriend like ditched them or something like that, then it can break their heart and then they can try to attempt it. So. And also access to lethal means like access. And so these, this is, this is a model how to show like how the kids can, what the kids can go through. So there is a genetic <clears throat> basis, some childhood adversity. Now there is a lot of research, which is being uh, told on adversity, <clears throat> childhood adversity, like now even criminal justice system is playing, um, paying a lot of attention like how we are raising our children. When the baby is born, like is the mother paying attention as soon as the, when the baby is crying or are they just like busy in their own work? Uh, when the kids are home, are we sitting at least for 10, 10 15 minutes and talking to the children? Are, what is going on in your school? Are you being bullied? Are you having any problem in school? I think parents need to open up and please talk to your children. I think that can prevent a lot of problems. Why? Because when someone is genetically predisposed and there is some adversity in their life, then this HPA axis, I'm going to explain that. HPA means uh, hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, right? In that, the two things which I said, like pessimism is because there is some substance called norepinephrine is depleted in the brain. Aggression and impulsivity happens when the serotonin is depleted in the brain. So why this is important is stress stress will um, there is a normally there is like a feedback loop in our brain the cortisol is called the stress hormone whenever we are under stress um, cortisol is the hormone which is released from your adrenal gland so if more cortisol is released then the brain tells hey but just calm down and it is it releases acth in a less amount so that that feedback loop is closed. But let us say somebody is going through chronic stress. Chronic stress could be as simple as playing video games all day long, right? Or looking at their iPhone 24 hours, like looking at all the social media, they're constantly under stress. So imagine like why video games are bad because like somebody shooting at you all the time, you have scared whether somebody is going to come and kill you within the game. And that stress is enough to go back and affect your uh, neurotransmitters in your brain. So this is another way. So your adrenal cortex is releasing cortisol and this can go and affect your immune system and it shuts off the brain production of the hormones. And those two things which I talked about, norepinephrine and serotonin can go down. When norepinephrine goes down, you get pessimistic. When serotonin goes down, you get uh, impulsivity. What is the best way? To improve serotonin, by the way, exercise, right? When you exercise, so exercise can get you, this is the easiest method to get out of depression is exercise. So when they did studies, they found that like, you know, 
in the brain that a portion of the brain called prefrontal cortex is where like the less serotonin is there. So pay attention to that. Now, we said that suppose somebody has underlying mood disorder, there was a stressful life event. Now they're planning to kill themselves. But suppose they have impulsivity and hopelessness and access to lethal means. That means they have access to a gun or access to like a knife or even sleeping pills, all those things. Or they're seeing somebody is doing that. Let me also do some imitation, right? So these all these areas present as good places where we can prevent this from happening. What we are doing now is education and awareness program that works on like detecting mood disorder. Like how do we, I'm going to like explain to you like what are the questions we are supposed to ask to detect a mood disorder. Screening for individuals at high risk. Treat the patient. If you treat a patient with, uh, you know, don't be afraid. Like, you know, in some cultures, they don't want to go to see a mental health specialist. They think that it is a taboo. But I'm telling you, the moment you say that I have a problem, 50% of the problem disappears. So then when you go see a doctor, they can put you on some medication, antidepressants, right? Or they can give you psychotherapy. They can you just go and talk to somebody. Just by talking to somebody and saying, look, I have a problem. It could be your mom. It could be your sister. It could be your brother. It could be your close friend. Just by talking, it will the, it'll come out of your chest and you will feel much, much, much better. And then a restriction of access to lethal means and then um, not publicizing um, you know, some, when something bad happens. So these are some of the um, restriction of the lethal means that we can do. Um, so you have to detect the warning signs. And then like you need to have some internal coping strategies, have a plan. Like, you know, the child should be given a plan. Suppose the child is not feeling good. Whom can she call? Whom, should, whom can um, he reach out for help? And, you know, which professional can they uh, go to, right? And there is number of uh, line, the number of places like National Suicide Prevention Hotline and all those things, which are always there. Or you can talk to your um, doctor also. So these are the resources from which we have taken these uh, slides. So uh, th this is like a quick presentation on the. Uh, let me see here one second. I also wanted to uh, share with you what are the common conditions, mental health conditions, anxiety, depression, aggression, ADHD. These are the common four things that we see, right? So how do we um, how do we address somebody who's having depression? Like we ask questions like how has you how has your mood been lately? Have you lost interest in usual things that you used to enjoy? Have you been sleeping too much? Have you been um, noticing a decrease in your energy level. These are the type of questions. But let us say uh, you have anxiety, right? Uh, we ask them, do you worry a lot? Do you, have you gotten really scared all of a sudden? Some patients tell us that they are sweating a lot. Uh, they're like shaking too much for no particular reason. They're having trouble breathing, heart pounding. So uh, ADHD, attention deficit is very, very common. Sometimes uh, the children cannot focus in school. They, like, um, they cannot pay attention. Uh, the teachers are saying that the kid is not learning properly. It is not the kid's fault. Any of these mental health conditions, it is not the kid's fault. They're not doing it. They're not bad children. They, are, they need help. If you bring them to the physician, the physician like me, like a pediatrician can screen. Same thing with aggression, like what happened yesterday? Can it be prevented? Like we ask these questions, when was the last time you got angry? What is the angriest you have got? Okay, what is the worst fight? Have you ever used a weapon in a fight? Okay, have you ever done anything to hurt yourself or someone else? Have you stolen anything? These are questions. These are the four common things that I would like to share uh, with the thing. And finally, there is, a, let me show you something. Any questions till now? Any questions?
I just wanted to share this. Are you able to see this by any way, Ms. Asma? Uh, not yet, Dr. Madhuraju. Not yet, okay. Not yet. One second, let me share this. So when a, when, when a child comes into our office, every single child starting five years of age, we are giving them this checklist. And I really, I'm going to share this to your group and I want you to share it with all the parents. It's called pediatric symptom checklist. Just 17 questions. In these 17 questions, the parent has to answer, like, is your child fidgety, unable to sit still? Never, sometimes, often, just put a check mark. And then, we score it on the right side, the office scores it. Just by filling up these, we will be able to, I don't know if you're able to see I, A, and E. The final score is marked down here, right? So by, by answering these 17 questions, we will be able to separate out, does your child have depression? Does your child have ADHD? Or does your child have anxiety? Or is your child completely normal? So if, if a score is above 15 in the score, right? So how do we score it? When you say zero, when they say never, we score it zero here. When you say sometimes, you skip, we score it as one. So leave the scoring to the doctors. But basically, this is a very simple thing. Let us say your child came to the doctor's office. In a well check, in a physical, we do lab tests. Every child, every year in my office gets lab tests. We are checking for anemia. We're checking for cholesterol. We're checking for vitamin D, right? Thyroid. Every child gets it. But unfortunately, to detect mental health conditions, we do not have any blood work. Only thing we have is questionnaire. So in this case, let us say we, did, we gave this test to some child and the child showed that the score is for internalizing is more than five. That means we think that this is a screening test. Your child could have depression. Now, can your child have depression and also have anxiety? In that case, this score in externalizing here, E, is going to come as more than seven, right? Just by answering these 17 questions. Then we go to the next step, right? I have this questionnaire, by the way, in Spanish also, because sometimes, you know, patients don't speak English. And we could really translate this into any language that, um, and it's freely available uh, in the internet. <clears throat> These are not uh, copyrighted or anything like that. Then we give them, if suppose somebody is depressed, nine questions we give them. Again, I want to tell you there is no blood test for depression. But these nine questions, does your child have little interest or pleasure in doing things, feeling down or depressed, trouble falling asleep, poor appetite, feeling bad, where... Now, how is this making your life? Is it difficult, somewhat difficult, or very difficult? Ten questions you answer, the, the doctor, pediatrician will be able to know whether you have mild depression, moderate depression, or severe depression. It's very important to know. Don't be afraid to come to the doctor. If you, if you come to the doctor, the doctor can make it like almost like opening a banana and telling you, better, why don't you eat like that, right? So... You came to our office, we gave you this uh, thing, we found some depression. Now we can say you have mild depression or moderate depression or severe depression. And depending on it, once you know what it is, the treatment is very simple. The treatment is extremely simple. Now, let us say we found, we found you have anxiety. Yes, there is like a questionnaire for childhood anxiety. It's called scared, right? There's a child version. Child children, is, when I feel frightened, it is hard for me to breathe somewhat sometimes or very often right I, I get scared if i sleep away from home so these are like questions there is like almost 41 questions in scared if your score is more than 25 that means you are having a generalized anxiety disorder again they, they go by question if you add all these questions and if your score is more then you may have panic disorder you may have a separation anxiety disorder it's just there is no blood test again there is 41 questions and then when you break it down and score it we will tell you okay you have social anxiety disorder so it's, this is very very simple it's not complicated at all you know uh, for a person who knows it now there is 
autism. Autism is very, very common. Like every time I walk into a room and the child is like, you know, 12 months old or 15 months old, I'm like scared in my heart, like, because, oh my God, this kid, does he have autism? A very simple test. It's again available in Spanish and English. There is 23 questions and we, it's a simple yes and no questions. If there's more than three or four questions which are positive, yes, we will have to refer you to a good neurologist. We have excellent neurologists uh, in our area um, and we can send them to one of the neurologists in the area. And then, but screening is very important. If we know that there is a problem, it is very, very, this is the main message that I want to give you is don't be afraid to come to the doctor and ask for advice. So we can detect a autism as early as even one year of age, 15 months of age. So just you need to come and ask. Now, attention deficit, suppose somebody has attention deficit, we can, there is a questionnaire here. This is called Vanderbilt rating scale. This is the last one I'm going to go over with you guys today. It is again available in English and Spanish. Does not pay attention to details and makes careless mistakes. The first nine questions will tell if somebody has inattention. The next nine question tells us if somebody is hyperactive. If both inattention and hyperactivity is there, we call it attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. The next questions go into like bullies and threatens and intimidated others, starts physical fights, lies to get out of trouble. All these are like personality, like the aggression and uh, oppositional defiant. All those things can be made out with this simple 47, I mean 55, questionnaire and then when we score it we say okay in the first nine questions how many you got score of two or three in the second uh, nine questions like from 10 to 18 how many did you get scoring simple scoring will be done right and based on that we can uh, rip it apart and tell you whether your child has only inattention whether your child has hyperactivity combination of attention and hyperactivity sometimes adhd comes with friends they are sometimes oppositional sometimes they are so they need help okay the more we are able to identify we can say okay this is the area the child needs to improve and suppose your child doesn't have anything everything is going to come back normal in the first test itself like in the first psc 17 itself it's going to come back that saying that your child is completely normal so in my office i'm screening these children starting five years of age my goal is to prevent tragedies from happening in my opinion if we treat these children if we detect if we if I am able to finish screening all these children, I have more than 2,000, 3,000 children. I think of them as my own children, as my own family members. If I can finish screening, I will know exactly who is in trouble, who is going to fall in trouble. I'm going to prevent them from happening. And that is my goal. So I rest my case. If you have any questions, please uh, go ahead and ask me. Thank you. Yes. Uh, yes. Good evening, doctor. Um, uh, thank you for your time. Thank you for being here with us. My name is Malali and I had a question. Can you please provide four or five like practical examples, um, you know, something the parents can do um, to tell the kids that you mentioned exercise, but if you could just uh, add to that list, some things we can do with our kids that would prevent um, mental illness. You mentioned exercise, but and um, uh, obviously uh, cutting down on the screens or maybe diet or yeah i think uh, that that that's an uh, that that's an excellent uh, question right so there is something called like uh, self care success now staying physically fit the number one the cheapest way to avoid mental health problems and to treat mental health problems is staying physically active the more phys it has been, studies have shown beyond doubt that if you exercise like well as a family you can exercise right with your child you can go out for a small walk and while you're going talk and as a parent listening is also very important you allow your teenager to talk right without any judgment this is where it's very difficult even for me even though i'm telling you these things like suppose the kid is coming 
it takes a lot for them to come and talk to us at the, when they are teenagers. When when they are telling, be non-judgmental. Just listen to them what they are saying. Don't judge them like one. Whether don't tell immediately like oh you, what you are doing is right or what you are doing is wrong. Just listen. Okay, okay. Just listen and schedule some pleasant activities like you know something which as a family that you can enjoy. Suppose it could be simple watching a movie together. or like uh, playing board games with your child right or um, going to the place of worship together right all those things are very pleasant activity eating balanced meal like cooking sometimes children like cooking we give them a recipe and then let them make bake some cookies or like you know uh, some food like you know desi food or whatever it is like they want to make let them make some food for you and feed you or something and then spend time with people uh, or activities where they can support and just sometimes just spend time relaxing don't pack i think the biggest mistake that i have seen um, is going after big name schools like big colleges like right? you know making telling the kid that oh if you don't get into for example xyz college then your uh, life is worthless don't say that to the child because you know you could be successful anywhere basically if you are happy you can be successful anywhere take away the stress and tell your child like look we love you no matter whether you are an a plus student or a d some kids are good in studies some kids are very good in some art or skill you find what your child is uh, really uh, interested in and then have small goals and simple steps and uh, i think one of the things when i was doing an autism presentation and one of the autism parents whose child has autism who's like 30 year old she said like she enjoys even a little thing if the child can find like a simple item she celebrates it like every little thing that your child does you know try to uh, embrace it and be very happy that's the all i mean these are the simple suggestions that i can give you Thank you so much, uh, Sister Malali, for asking the question. Doc- Thank you so much, Dr. Krishna, for a valuable presentation from the neurobiology and the science of the brain to the, all the common uh, mental health issues that we see in our youth to the like the common the treatment option that you have discussed. It's really valuable, Dr. Madhuraj. I have like two questions. First, like the common misconception, or is it true that once you your child is on a drug for to aid for depression or anything, they have to be on these drugs for the rest of their lives this is a like a most common concern that the parents have so they do they are scared to seek help because once the child ha- is on them they have to take it for the rest of their life so is is that a fact or is it a myth i think it is a myth okay uh, in fact let us say your child is having really depression uh, is it better for the child to be on some medication and be stay safe or not be on any medication and something bad happens to your child that's number one but usually children go to go through some crisis if you are able to like safely safeguard them and get them over that tough period in their life right you can slowly wean them off a little bit later you know uh, in in life and not only that there are newer technologies now i don't know in suppose you listen to wtop news or one of the news channel you will hear that there is like uh, you know tms therapy transcranial magnetic stimulation it's a very simple therapy it's just like putting headphones right and then you go there you sit there and then like you know they they put it uh, and then within 15 minutes you are done you know and what it does is it just magnets and stimulates different portions of your brain and then i again we should remove the taboo the one thing that if you we can achieve is like for example i how do i know all these things my own children went through this okay it doesn't matter whether you are a doctor's son or a doctor's daughter you cannot get it it doesn't you don't have to be from a rich family or a poor family it can come from all walks of life but the only thing is when you accept it yes it is there and seek help you are much better off than what you were before like you know if you never got any treatment otherwise every day you have to live in fear and then like say what is going to happen and all those things so 
Thank you so much for this uh, like detailed answer. And Dr. Madhuraju, one more thing that you you shared really uh, important and really uh, like good detailed checklist for the common signs and symptoms of some common uh, mental health diseases. So these checklists, are these only for youth or can adult use the same checklist and diagnose and then seek help if they need to? I have, I think the adults also can use the same uh, checklist. Okay. These are, these have been made for youth, but like, you know, uh, suppose somebody has attention deficit as a child and they became 18 years of age. Do you think the attention deficit is going to disappear? No, there is a lot of adults who uh, are impulsive. In fact, many of these adult things continue into adulthood. In fact, if you take like in the jail system, so many people end up in jail, unfortunately, but I think many of them are preventable. Like I had a patient, you know, in Fredericksburg, he came to the office and he said, sir, I got arrested. Like what happened? Uh, somebody said something to my girlfriend, right? Instead of verbally like saying something back, the guy punched the other person, right? But the sheriff was very tough and he took and arrested this kid. He was in 30 days in the jail before even the judge saw him. So juvenile justice system, many, many people are there because they're unable to control the impulse. Let us say in our screening, we found that this kid is having some impulsive category. This kid like gets some behavioral therapy. There is something called cognitive behavior therapy, CBT. That works very good for uh, many conditions, including anxiety, depression, and stuff like that. They can give them coping skills and say, like, next time you're angry, instead of using your hands or anything like that, you can calmly, like, how do you, like, relate your thoughts to the other person without getting too upset or something like that. So these skills will really help those patients. So this questionnaire, yes, can be used even for adults. It, we can detect a lot of... Uh, one, one of my close friends, sometimes, you know, he just came and he said, like, look, I'm going through tough. Faith. People, where I found is, it's very difficult for them to come and ask for help. So this, through this medium, we are telling them, look, it is so easy. It is like just giving, filling up a couple of papers. You don't need to even talk anything. You just like circle and then give it to the doctor. The doctor is going to say, okay, you have this and then refer you to the right place. And then you will get the right uh, help that you deserve, you know, uh, and we can save so many people and even including marriages are broken down sometimes yeah. because sometimes they say stuff which they don't mean from yeah. their heart. And once you say something, you cannot take it back. And then the spouse gets upset because the person has said something and then marriages can break, divorces can happen. So, so many societal problems origin is again from mental health and i think if we can use these toolkits which i'm going to share it with you in the email um yeah you can put it on your website it will help a lot of people they can do self filling up the form the only thing is scoring you know they may need some help and then like you know treatment they can come but at least one of the things i was talking to a teenager and he said sir why don't we just give it to all the school children i said like look we know somebody in the school board, Dr. Latif is on the school board, right? If he can help us get this thing onto the school, every kid can be screened, literally, right? And things, I mean, if we want to change, this is where we need to change, you know? We need some um, help so that, like, we can get uh, these tools out to the children and the families. Thank you so much. You uh, well said about the, the bringing the change and being a part of it. So what we can do as an individual and as a community is to start the change within ourselves. We need to educate ourselves, of course. We need to find the right resources, right uh, answers to these questions. And we should not hesitate to seek help when we see a need. This begins with ourselves first, of course, if we see a need in ourselves as community leaders, as uh, scout leaders who are watching with me, or as anyone, as parents, if we think we need help, we should go out and seek help and admit that in front of our kids. So when they need help, they are not hesitant to come to you. And as Dr. <clears throat> Madaraju mentioned, uh, don't be judgmental when you are talking to your teenagers or kids or in any, uh, any scenario in community settings, in any, don't be judgmental and like, be a good listener. That, that will help a lot. 
everyone has emotions everyone will have stresses everyone has ups and downs but know your feelings and know how to act with with, with during that time is the key thank you so much everyone who was watching if everyone anyone else has questions we are running out of time so please post them on the facebook comment box and i will address those or reaching out to dr madaraju and i will get back to you with the answers thank you dr madaraju once again it was really nice having you and it was really uh, valuable and informative presentation i hope whoever watched will benefit from it and share it as much as they can with others uh, once you share your um, the resources that you you presented i will post them on the facebook i will share them on the whatsapp community group so we can take benefit from it the only thing as a parent and as um, as like as a health committee uh, chair i would like to say that please do not self diagnose kids if you are watching do not self diagnose using these forms talk to an adult talk to primary care doctors are the best uh, go to for these kind of things but once these resources are available you can have yourself aware like use them but do not self diagnose go to a doctor when you need to go thank you so much once again dr madaraju thank you everyone for watching everyone who was on zoom or facebook stay safe take care of yourselves take care of people around you uh, stay active of course exercise is the the key even if you start with 5 minutes of a walk uh, daily be outside it's really good weather during the summers be active take care of yourself and inshallah we will be back with another session soon uh, we are planning to go back in person as we used to we will announce that um, soon on the social media inshallah but until then take care of yourself it stay safe and assalam alaikum